Welcome to episode 10 of Conversations with Lulu. I'm Lulu Khazan. I'm an entrepreneur living in Dubai, an investor, a mother, and your host. My guest today is Dina Al Mufti. Uh, Dina is an Egyptian entrepreneur whom I've had the pleasure to meet in 2016 as we were both part of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Entrepreneurship Program, which was co-sponsored by the U.S. State Department. Dina founded Injaz Egypt. It's an NGO that works with the public and the private sectors to bring special programs and work readiness skills into schools and universities. Injaz has impacted the lives of 800,000 students. Injaz has also launched a startup incubator and has helped over 80 startups launch and scale in Egypt and the region. Dina has received numerous awards for her work, including the Young Achiever of the Year by Arabian Business in 2016, and was nominated as one of the world's most influential young Arabs under 40 by Arabian Business. Dina, thank you so much for joining me. What an ben honor to be on your podcast. <laughs> I'm so proud of you for launching it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Dina. The, others, the honor is mine. I've been a, a huge fan of you ever since we met in, uh, in the US. You know, what I love about you is you're actually making impact. A lot of us, you know, can only hope to make impact uh, one way or the other. But with you, you've, you know, you've touched the lives of, of 800,000 uh, students in Egypt. You, you do impact every day. So maybe I wanted to, to learn a bit more about uh, why did you do this? And, and, and you know, how did you get into in jazz and, and, and why kind of go down this path? Okay, so maybe like just thinking back and reflecting, you got me doing a lot of reflecting, <laughs> preparing for your podcast. And uh, it got me thinking, like, as a kid, I grew up in the Gulf. I actually grew up in Kuwait. And on every holiday, we'd come back to Egypt. And so I was always between, you know, the Gulf and, and Egypt. And as a child, in the, in the mind of a child, I'd always see, wow, what is this huge difference be between these two places where I live? Uh, you know, one, um, everything was pristine and clean and smooth and a very good education system and, and schools were great. And, and just coming uh, to Egypt, I, it's an explosive population, right? And uh, zahma and like crowds. Zahma. And as I grew, obviously, in school and then went to college and understood, you know, the socioeconomic gaps and all of that and, and what triggers them and why that is, so I knew that I wanted to, you know, create positive change and do something that was socially driven. So that I knew for sure. And, um, and so after college, just a few years after college, I had an opportunity to pilot in jazz in Egypt. And it was basically, uh, you know, in jazz is part of a global organization called Junior Achievement. And, um, and its programs are all about entrepreneurship, uh, you know, spreading an entrepreneurial culture in schools and universities with young people, uh, spreading financial literacy, spreading work readiness skills and character building. So it was all about that. And I got really, really excited about this. Like it really matched what I was looking for, you know, that passion to make an impact. And I really believed it was all about education to create change. Absolutely. So, so that's how, kind of, you know, the opportunity came to me, how it all began. And uh, my dad, who's, you know, a, very much a businessman, a business leader, a corporate leader, uh, was really confused. He's like, why would you set up an NGO with all this education that you have and, and earn a fraction of what you would make in the corporate world, why would you do that? He didn't why get would it. You do that? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, and and as a twenty-three-year-old at the time, you know that really wasn't the driver for me at all. You know, and money. It was all about something that had an impact and would make a difference. That's so all money, that drove me. Money was not a driver for you as a twenty-three-year-old, which is which absolutely is not. And that really, really confused and troubled my dad. Like. You don't know what you're doing. But of course, he saw like how per insistent I was and how excited I was. And of course, my family was always incredibly supportive and gave me all their support. 
Do you, do you feel that you, you were able to, to take these risks? I mean, you, you studied, you were fortunate to, uh, to do your uh, undergraduate and graduate in the U.S. Uh, I mean, you went to top universities in the U.S. Do you feel that being part of this environment helps you take more risks? Do you feel that we, we have this, we encourage students in our part of the world to uh, you know, not be the norm or do something different? Uh, no, I also went to AUC as well. Um, and so, no, I don't feel I, I don't feel like at university or your education system teaches you about, you know, taking risk. It's really innate. And if you're just following something you really, really believe in, it just, you know, puts you in a state of flow where honestly, I promise you, like it's like you're in synchronicity and just opportunities come and and things you know things happen um to to move you along when you're in that state of flow and you're doing something that you love and you're passionate about i mean i had all the challenges in the world that you can possibly imagine in the beginning starting this like from day one so, when so i had this tell me opportunity, about your challenges yeah so from day one when i got the opportunity to launch this pilot that same week, I found out I was pregnant with my first daughter. <laughs> wow, at 23. I mean, after, right after, yeah, I mean, uh, we had, me and my husband got married right after college and I started working. And just when I got this opportunity, I found that I was pregnant. So I felt like, uh, like I was having twins that year or something. <laughs> and so I can't, like, I can't begin to tell you like, uh, the challenges of you're, you're, you're pregnant and you're starting this new organization and the amount of permits and licenses and clearances that you have to do. I always say like starting up an NGO is probably a hundred times more difficult than launching a startup. <sighs> so here I am, this you know young girl in her 20s and I have to go to all these you know bureaucratic agencies and meet with all these bureaucrats and uh, they'd see me and take one look at me and go, Intimin, who are you? Give me someone older to speak to. Hati <laughs> Mudirik. And they wouldn't realize, Mudir, there is no boss. <laughs> this is what we're doing. And this is uh, what we're uh, you know, aiming to achieve in schools. And these are our programs. They're so amazing. They're global programs. We're giving them for free in the schools. And all we want is your uh, approval and acceptance for us to enter <laughs> and uh, give it in hisas and nashat or like the activity lessons. And I'd go on and on and on, like so excited about what <laughs> this amazing thing and that we're bringing into the, the schools. Yeah, and I was praying, but it probably wasn't still showing yet when I was okay. in the approvals part. And so half of these bureaucrats would, you know, be so annoyed that this little kid is coming and asking them for, for stuff. And, and, and they don't understand, like, oh, they want to talk to someone senior, someone older, and they didn't understand, what do you mean you have no boss? So, so that was an experience. The other half of them wanted to know, you know, more social things like how old you are you and are, are you, you married? married? <laughs> you know, so so being young and a girl and you're going into this completely different culture, it's like you're an alien, really. And uh, so anyway, I don't know if it was so that was one hurdle to cross. And then another hurdle was the conspiracy theory. What are these programs that you want to bring into schools? What are you trying to teach these kids? You know, I, I we're like, it's all about entrepreneurship and how to start your business. And look, they're going to learn skills on how to improve their characters and how to be ready for the world of work and on and on and on. And they're like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and they and they, uh, you know, after a lot of time, they'd finally yeah. approve. And then another hurdle with the security, getting security clearances from Amn Dawla. Can you imagine? Uh, it's like I was in a uh, black and white. So you're not uh, some, uh, some spy. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. and so with the Amn Dawla, uh, who are you funded by? And uh, you know the conspiracy theory of are you funded by certain countries who have a hidden agenda? So like you have to go through all of this and just really convince them that honestly, like with all honesty and all transparency, you're just there to, you know, deliver these programs that will be so useful to these 
to these students and will really create a mind shift and will empower them and you know make it create an empowered generation and i'd go on and on with my uh, you know in, in my little you know pep talk to them and try and convince them how did you get them to take these meetings actually and how how long did it take you i mean because you work with private sector with with government with the schools so this is only the the, the government uh hurdle. yes and that so, was so, really, so how did you really get the meeting? most difficult yeah this is really the most difficult so we'd have to find someone who knew who had a contact use, uh, at the Wasta? ministry ah yeah, yeah sometimes you have to know someone who knows someone who is in the ministry to get you a meeting and you'd finally go and you know you'd end up going there almost every day to make sure they're remembering you know that you you're waiting for your permit you're waiting for your clearance and i don't know whether it's being persistent like i'd like to think it was being persistent and not giving <laughs> up but they probably got really bored out of their minds <laughs> seeing this little girl come into their office every day nagging them and that's probably why i got the clearance in the end but regardless of the reason Thank God we got the clearance and we're able to go full force ahead and uh, and uh, get uh, private sector buy-in was actually way easier than than the government's buy-in. At the time, corporate social responsibility was becoming more more of a you know of an importance on the corporate agenda. So when, when was to, that? that uh, was, uh, that this was is cool. early two thousand. Early two thousand. Yeah, so this is 2003 when we first started. And uh, so corporate social responsibility was becoming more and more something that corporates took seriously, especially the multinational ones. So that the first year we were, um, you know, we were able to get two corporates uh, to work with us and give us 10 of their staff to volunteer. Can you, can you explain uh, I, that part, please, Dina? So how, how did NJAS work? You had to you had to get the permits from the government. And, yes, to get and, clearance to enter into school. Yeah, and then you had the curriculum, which was basically adapted from uh, a global curriculum. And, and the focus was on, on what, what kind of disciplines? Yeah, so uh, entrepreneurship, work readiness skills, and financial literacy. So these programs were all Arabized, and then we had to adapt them also to fit, suit the Egyptian culture and get clearance on them from the government. Once we did, we need to get the buy-in of private sector because private sector would give us volunteers and would ha help to sponsor these programs at the schools. So what you're doing initially is you're bridging the gap between what the pro public education system is graduating in terms of students and the needs of the working world, you know, driven by the private sector, there is a huge gap there. And what you do is you're bridging that gap through these programs that you're giving to students in schools and universities from a young age, you're giving them the skills, the knowledge um, uh, that they're not uh, getting in schools from a young age uh, along those lines. Amazing. So. so uh, so the 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 people delivering these uh, these training programs were volunteers from the corporates. Yes. Great. And and what yes. what were the ages uh, basically of the of the students that you were dealing with? So when we first started off, it was uh, middle school students. So let's say sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, set up today. Uh, يعني, uh, sorry, not set up today. So it was so the, kind the of the middle is... school. They're like eight, 11 years old wow. uh, to 15. Okay. This is the first group we started with. And so the private sector's role would be uh, to uh, provide us volunteers. So this was, this was, you know, it hit, it checked off a lot of, you know, things for the private sector company where it would be, you're, you know, it could be like a team building activity for their team and their staff. It's also checking the box of giving back, uh, doing so, something that's socially responsible. Yeah. And so it was really great, the involvement of the corporates. So that first year, um, that first year we had two corporates who gave us 10 volunteers from their staff that we trained on these uh, curriculums and basically they'd go into a classroom with a, a teaching kit and that teaching kit has their workbook, 
the activity book for the students. It'll have any material that they need to teach the class. And we'd give them, we train them on that before they went into the classroom. So what about the schools? So How are the, the schools? Okay, so, so the schools also, because they were public sector schools, that was a challenge, but it helped that we had the permits to enter. Uh, but what was challenging was convincing principals to give us that activity hour in the middle of the school day. Uh, like Hisset and Nashat, it's called, that activity okay. lesson where they usually take, you know, uh, other activities that it would become an in-jazz class. And so that was a bit of a challenge, but I'm telling you, all of this was about building relationships, creating trust. That's huge, especially with public sector. Um, you know, uh, it's all about relationship building and building trust because once we did that, it was really amazing how they started really to see the difference in the students and really believe in the impact of the program. And, uh, you know, things ran a, a lot more smoothly at that point. Um, so you became a, you became a master uh, influencer, basically, and a... And a huh. Not, not today's influencer, obviously, it has a different <laughs> meaning, but... At the time. <laughs> so you learned, you learned very early on how to walk into rooms full of uh, men of a, of a certain, let's say, background, and then being able to influence uh, at, you know, at, at all levels and, and get what you wanted, which was fantastic. Yeah, but I, ha I have to say, I was very, very fortunate uh, you know, that year when I went on, that year when we first started and est established and we're getting the permits is when I met my partner because I, when I was going on my maternity leave, she came and tempted for me and we really clicked and we really, you know, balanced each other, uh, balanced each other's strengths and weaknesses. And so uh, it really helped a lot. My partner, Dalia, is maybe 10 years older than me. And so it really helped when we'd go see officials. <laughs> they'd, you know, speak to Dalia and take her a lot more seriously than they did me. <laughs> but uh, so, so it really helped us in balancing things out as we grew and as we were, you know, growing a team and, and all of that. And uh, of course, behind the scenes of all of this, I was growing my family. I had my first baby. A year and a half later, I had my second baby. Wow. And so it was really, really a juggle uh, between, you know, something I was so, like, I felt I was on a mission. I was on a mission with Injez. And at the same time, I was raising and growing my family. I was like trying to balance and juggle between these two worlds. And I feel very, very fortunate and blessed that I have an amazing support system with my family. Uh, my mom, for example, would come and pick up my daughter at eight o'clock in the morning before I went to the office and take care of her all day. And then when I finished wow. the office, I'd go and pick her up. Um, my husband, very much a modern day dad, very hands-on, very involved. Uh, so I had a really good family support system. And at the same time, I had a, a great support from my partner. And so really, this is the essence of what helped it, you know, grow and, and move along and help me not go insane through this entire process. <laughs> when you were working fundraising, for instance, did you have to compromise on, on some of the things you wanted to do in order to win a corporate on board? Uh, w w was there an element of that or did you really get everything you wanted? Uh, no, of course, in the beginning, it's uh, all throughout, actually, the process. It's been a very hard, having very heartfelt, transparent uh, discussions with our partner companies. And uh, it's always been about, you know, not promising the moon uh, and then under delivering. So you have to make your expectations very, very clear from the start. Uh, not, you know, given to audacious requests that, you know, you won't be able to deliver on. Um, it, it really, it's about being transparent all throughout, being very clear on, on what you can uh, deliver and about what mutual added value you can both bring to the table and how you can um, basically, you know, have a stronger collaboration and, um, and, and just bring something of added value 
to the whole process when you work together. Absolutely. You so you want and obviously you wanted people to to take what you are doing seriously as well, right? This is not uh, something nice or something cute, as you said. This is something that has a lot of impact, and they should invest yes. in it. Yes. Yes, and and that also took time because uh, they might be in the beginning a bit skeptical about you know sponsoring these programs or where are their staff going to volunteer. But uh, so it it took time really to uh to prove to them the process and and to get them excited about it and and to see the potential that it was was serving at the end of the day and it, it, some things just take time really and with time and as you prove the impact of it and the impact shows and they see the difference and they speak about it more the volunteers spoke about it so we had more volunteers who wanted to come in and join the process more companies Companies talked about it and other companies would find out. So it really grew or organically at the end of the day. So you started a, an, an incubator. So first you started, you know, uh, the classes in the schools with the volunteers and the corporates, and then you decided to take it one step further and you wanted to help uh, young people start businesses. So I guess it came as a natural step, but, but how was that process as well? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting how it happened because so we started in 2003 and all throughout, you know, we're, uh, you know, growing in schools and growing in universities and, um, you know, uh, building this entrepreneurial mindset and culture through our programs. And we were delivering a lot of programs at universities. And we found that a lot of our alumni kind of caught the entrepreneurial bug and really wanted to continue with, you know, their business ideas because part of our programs uh, like one, one which is called the company program really helps them simulate turning an idea into an actual business and managing it and growing it and, you know, generating revenue and all of that. And so from that experience, it really inspired a lot of our students who are still, you know, at university. And when they graduated, some of them actually wanted to continue with this, but didn't know where to go for support or what to do. Um, and so in 2011, running this program called The Company and the, the revolution happening and all of that, and knowing that we had a lot of you know, alumni who were really keen and eager to continue with their businesses, we got this idea that, OK, what will it take for us to really help and support them to you know, help them with their idea and help them with their business? And how can we support them? How can we seed fund uh, their businesses? And from there, a startup, our accelerator was born. And so this is early 2011. And at the time, there wasn't much happening in terms of accelerators or incubators. Um, it, it was still, you know, in the nascent phases. And uh, it was really amazing. Like that first uh, year, we were able to launch maybe eight startup businesses from our accelerator and they all got seed funding that was averaging around from like small seed funds so from like maybe five thousand dollars to maybe twenty thousand dollar funding seed funding for egypt this is this is an okay yes. uh, amount to kind of yes. get an idea into uh, uh, let's say a, a minimum viable product or or some form of prototype right yes absolutely, absolutely. And, and were the funds so, given or or was it uh, or was it against equity or was it like a grant? No, it was like a grant. So okay. uh, so so this encouraged you know a lot of um, of young entrepreneurs who wanted to pursue their startups to um, apply to our accelerator because we gave them a lot of exposure and uh, mentorship and trainings that really helped support them to grow and scale. And we didn't take equity from the very beginning. And, and then we'd see like incredible, you know, results happening because we give them that first initial push. Um, again, we're a social organization, socially backed. We, as an NGO, we can't take equity anyways. But uh, our intention was really to give them that first push uh to to grow and scale did you did you uh was it inclusive like did you did you get a lot of people from let's say different 
parts of Egypt? Did you get men and women? Like, was it was it all from like a, a you know a same area or was it diverse? No, so we got it. We got people who were coming in from Cairo and other governorates. Um, it was a mix. What we didn't see a lot of were young women. And so the next round, the following year, we put in a clause that anyone applying has to have, uh, has it ha the, their teams have to be a mix of men and women, that we wouldn't be taking, you know, all male teams or, and so, and so we slowly started to see, you know, some girls trickling in into teams. And we were always asking like, why, why aren't there more, uh, young women getting involved in this. And there were a lot of cultural barriers at the time. Uh, that that was the feedback that we kept getting. Like my parents don't want me to do this or my parents don't want me to stay up late and be working on this project with a group of boys. So it was a lot of cultural barriers to this, uh, to all obstacles. But then slowly, I guess by the time 2015 rolled around, we started to see all uh, all women led teams, which was amazing. Wow. Like a lot of women led teams and like that was a big shift to see that happening. This brings me to something that we noticed that when you shed light on a success story, it really creates uh, a, a cultural change around it. And um, uh, I, I don't know if you want to get into the, like some of the yes, success stories. Please, yeah, I, I, wanna, I want to hear, of course. Because I feel like that that really helped in that transition to seeing more and more startups coming about is that we'd find that, for instance, the media would highlight a certain success story. For example, we had uh, one company who had an entrepreneur out of a small town called Tanta out of Cairo, and uh, he was uh, graduating from uh, engineering college. And his parents were absolutely appalled that he wanted to continue with his business instead of becoming an engineer and working in a stable job and becoming, you know, working at a private sector company. They were horrified. And he was really persistent and insistent on it. What he did was he recycled, um, uh, he, he sort of like recycled these uh, electronics. So any old electronics, computers, TVs, uh, what have you, and he'd take these certain metals and he'd have them shipped and recycled and his business was doing really well and he wanted to continue and he was uh, gaining success and all that and he, he just pursued it and it was just so amazing to see a year later, maybe a year and a half, he was nominated on Forbes as one of the 10 startups to look out for in the Arab world. That was wow. pretty amazing. And just by that What's recognition, Recyclobikia. Okay. Yeah, so just by that highlight and recognition, the all, all the young people in Tanta wanted to become like Mustafa from Recyclobikia because, you know, wow. he became an instant role model for them. He's young and they're his 20s and created this. And so, again, it's like that cultural barrier slowly started to uh to subside some uh, somehow but but it's more like highlighting successes highlighting the women-led business successes for example we had uh, in 2015 one of the women-led businesses um got because uh, we'd have these run these local and regional competitions and they won the regional competition and got a lot of media attention and from this media attention we saw a lot of girls coming forward, you know, and, and taking this on as a possible career path. Uh, so it's amazing, like highlighting success stories, the power of highlighting success stories to change culture. And, and if I can give one more example of where, I, where, where we noticed this cultural shift completely take, take uh, shape is, for instance, uh, so we have been doing this for years. I mean, since 2003, trying to promote this mindset and culture of entrepreneurship. And then in 2017, there was the Egyptian version of Shark Tank that happened, which was called Hona Shabab, and it was run on CBC. And it was like a big, you know, a big uh, popular show here in Cairo. Everybody was watching it. 
And I was very, very fortunate to be one of the judges on that show, on that judging panel. And it was just phenomenal to see all the examples of young entrepreneurs and startups that would come to pitch to the judging panel, these incredible you know, ideas that they had, the true change makers. They were all addressing problems and, 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 and creating solutions through their businesses to solve these challenges that we face here in Egypt, whether you know, social, economic, in different aspects, uh, of society and and instantly overnight they it became a popular thing to you know for a lot of families started to accept that okay you can you can try out or pursue having your own business which was absolutely you know an appalling thing to do in the past but now i think families just watching the show and I don't want to generalize, but really, it's it really had an impact. Like we'd see like uh, such proud parents of their kids who like won on the show and won an investment, and they were so proud of them. And and the entrepreneur themselves would say, "My parents weren't accepting at all of me doing this, and it's just so heartwarming that my parents are encouraging me and supporting me now that I went on TV, and now it's become you know a very popular show, and everybody's following it." I believe this created a big cultural shift in in the perception of entrepreneurship where it was something risky and not encouraged and now uh, if you had a good idea and you can get support and you can pursue it yeah. families became more supportive of it and data by the way is backing what you're saying so my friend uh, philip who's the founder of magnet which is the you know, the platform where you can get a lot of uh, startup and investment data. Yeah. So obviously in Egypt, there has been uh, a couple of interesting uh, events recently. One, there was uh, an acquisition of uh, of a Muslim dating uh, uh, yes. app. Harmonica. Uh, they were yes. they were on the show. They won the, on the show of the. No Mola way. Shabib. Yeah. <laughs> So, so they got acquired by Match.com, which is which is a global player, which was uh, pretty interesting. And another thing, obviously, was uh, the company Fauri, which is a, a payments company, which uh, which IPO'd on the uh, on the on the Cairo Stock Exchange, uh, which uh, which was pretty interesting uh, on the Egyptian sorry stock exchange. And uh, and I have some notes here. So basically, the report said that. Uh, in 2019, Egypt had a record-breaking year in terms of number of deals. So you had 142 investments in startup, uh, which is 26% over 2018, and $95 million uh, in terms of investment value, which is 13% more than in 2018. So, so, so it's looking very promising. So obviously, uh, things are starting to change. And I, honestly, I don't see why not. It's a huge market, huge uh, yeah. So, so why you know why isn't Egypt the the, the startup hub? You know, uh, the equivalent of the UAE or what's happening in, uh, in Saudi now? What's missing? Do you? Yeah, think, no, you know? it kind of is. No, I mean, entrepreneurship is booming here. I mean, in the past just couple of years, we've seen so many accelerators pop up. It's it's been really growing and flourishing with accelerators, uh, new VCs coming in, new investment coming in. And um, no, we've, we're seeing more and more uh, startups on, you know, at, at various, uh, various scales coming up and, and really achieving notable success and, um, and, and saying, definitely see it as a hub. And you're saying the cultural barriers are also starting to, to subside or crumble bit by bit. Uh, so, so obviously that's, that's helping. So what's next, Dina? Your your uh, I know that you recently uh, stepped down of the operations uh, of the day to day, and you remain on the board of uh, of Ijaz, and that was a very recent decision. So uh, so what are you thinking? Well, I mean, uh, this is my baby of seventeen years, and you can't step <laughs> away from your baby, but you kind of transition to a different role. And so uh, myself and my partner, we transitioned into more of a strategic board member role going forward. And we were very fortunate, you know, uh, to, to have someone who was a former colleague of ours, 
who had worked with us before and had traveled to the US and then came back again. And we were very fortunate to have her on our team and, and lead the operations uh, moving forward. And we're still you know, involved in many ways. Um, in terms of you know, what's, what's next, um, so I'm, I'm still mentoring and supporting entrepreneurs, especially women-led businesses and women entrepreneurs. And it's, you know, something very satisfying and very rewarding for me and something, you know, uh, I enjoy doing a lot. And, um, at the same time, just continuing to make also sw some small investments and just, I guess, enjoying this phase of, yeah. I mean, since the world, the entire world is on pause <laughs> and slow down this is the time to slow down after running and you know being in this uh race for so many years yeah. um it's it, you know you you need to know when it's time to kind of slow down and take things easy <laughs> yeah so but you i i feel i sense i mean i follow you on social media and i sense that you're very much interested in um you know everything that has to do with mindfulness uh i feel that you um you know you're you're very much yeah thinking about uh how can i improve myself or better myself and how can i help others that's the that's the sense that i that i get absolutely yes i mean that's that's something i just you know really feel that it made a difference for me over the past 17 years in this career um a big part of it is getting your mindset right because as entrepreneurs running businesses we all go through this mental and emotional roller coaster and never no one ever teaches it really teaches us how to deal with it you kind of learn as you go and um and there's a lot of fear that comes in of you're managing day to day and responsibility over you know your team and salaries and things like that so that's a load on you um and and also you know as you're growing up you you notice that there's these limiting beliefs that maybe you need to rewire that are you know keeping you back and holding you back from reaching your fullest potential so, so these are all things that you know i've taken great interest in just because you know having lived li lived that experience i felt uh working on yourself personally like developing yourself has really paid off in a sense that um that like i feel like there's certain things that we've learned from it if you want me to get into them <laughs> tell me what did you what uh, what are some of your uh, what are some of your learnings from those uh, 17 years yeah so a lot and of learning. motherhood also uh, yeah and from motherhood and raising a family and you're trying to balance between these two worlds. And I think a lot of, like a lot of, you, you do a lot of growth and you make a lot of mistakes and you learn a lot. And so uh, like, for example, we'd be faced by a problem, my partner and I, or whatever. And like, it's, it looks like it's, we're doomed or something, you know? And our, my first reaction would be to go, Yala, we, the world is coming to an end, you know, and panicking and get all stressed. And I noticed that when we would be okay with this fallback plan or worst case scenario plan, and you can kind of rest into it and, okay, accept the, this worst case scenario if it happens and you can live with this kind of worst case scenario, it's really funny how things kind of start to open up or, or solutions start to happen. Um, I, I don't know, maybe it's because of you're not resisting so much, you know, that you want to have it this particular way and it has to be done in this way and scenario A has to happen. Scenario A won't always happen. So when you're okay and you can live with these other worst case scenarios, and you rest into them, uh, things start to look up. So this is one thing I found in like dealing with issues that come to us. It's not to panic, to come to it with a calm mind, which is often very hard to do, but you kind of have to disattach yourself emotionally from the issue. Because when you're emotionally tied to this issue or this challenge, sometimes you won't make clear decisions. So you have to emotionally detach, take a step back, 
How do you okay. emotionally it's, detach? Uh, like what's what's it, the it, process? It, it's, and... it, it's hard. It's hard, but uh, give me an you, example. You have to you have to like emotionally remove yourself from from the issue. Like I mean, we had. So you, uh, you sort of tell we yourself. Had case... uh, you tell yourself, for example, like it's it's not about me. I you know I shouldn't take it personally or or. Yeah, like... yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, like this one time we had to, we had uh, our, our funds frozen because as an NGO, you know, sometimes you have to get uh, clearances and these clearances can take longer than usual and they inter disrupt your cash flow completely. And it's really out of anyone's control or out of your hands. And um, so because it's out of control and out of your hands, you really need to emotionally detach yourself and understand it's not in your control. You you have to do everything you can to solve this and, and think to yourself, okay, this is what we'll do in scenario A. This is what we'll do in scenario B. Worst, worst case scenario, this is what's going to happen. But, uh, but yeah, so it, <clears throat> it's just an important process to like disattach. <clears throat> and when that happens, you can make clearer decisions. Okay. And also because you can get very emotional in things in, in your business. Like, for example, we had a high ranking minister once tell us what we're doing is a complete waste of time. Wow. And, and at a young age, you'd be totally susceptible to, to listen to this person and their high ranking official. They must be right. We, what we must, what we're doing must be a waste of time. You know, at a young age, you're very vulnerable or susceptible to what others say. But, uh, but actually what it did was do the opposite and really drove us to prove that what we're doing isn't a waste of time. In fact, it's, it's the most important thing we should be doing is empowering and impacting uh, the young people that we're working with. So it kind of drove us to prove the opposite. So, I mean, in this emotional roller coaster, you're going to face a lot of things. And I think it's when you have the confidence and passion over what you're doing, it really helps in overcoming a lot of these obstacles and, you know, building rapport with people and building trust and establishing a good uh, reputation. And another thing is to always have a positive outlook on things. And so when you're faced with these challenging challenges where we'd go, yeah, we, it's a musiba, <laughs> it's the end of the world. Uh, besides like the stepping back, emotionally detaching, thinking of worst case scenario plans and being okay with that, it's really having faith. I think faith is a very important element uh, that you should, you know, you should really have as an entrepreneur uh, and, and just believing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, there are good things that are coming, uh, you know, and, and just work through this darkness, this dark, you know, time and that something good is going to come because life is about cycles. There are cycles where you're up on top of the world. There's cycles where you're, you're, you're down and you feel like it's the end of the world and nothing good is going to come of this. Uh, look at us in COVID, in Corona. I mean, everybody is, uh, a lot of people are feeling this, uh, you know, uh, downward spiral. And it's really about having faith that something good is going to come at the end of this and always maintain this positive mindset and belief that uh, have faith and because God's got your back. Like, I, I'm a believer in that and it's really helped us a lot. And uh, I, I mean, finally, I always love to say that, you know, when you practice and do the internal work on the inside, you become strong on the inside. So when you're strong on the inside, you're invincible on the outside. When you're strong on the so, inside, you're invincible on the outside. Yes, yes. And that's why I feel it's a lot of, you know, it's all about personal growth, working on your mindset working on becoming mentally strong, emotionally strong. And there are many ways to do that. But I think that's the core essence of this journey that you take on. And I mean, you know, your work also is reflected in your life and life is reflected in your work. And it's all about building yourself and developing yourself as a person. 
at the end of the day. <laughs> great, uh, great uh, learnings and, uh, and great tips, Dina. I'm sure it comes with, uh, with maturity as well and it comes with experience. Uh, I, I, I'm sure if I had asked you this uh, when you started in jazz, obviously it would have been a completely different uh, set of recommendations. <laughs> Completely, I, I, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to recommend anything back then. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, and and you know, of course, uh, of course, age and experience it uh, it it makes you look at things differently. Uh, one thing, though, I mean, I agree with you in terms of the self development. It's definitely something that has helped me personally uh, along the way. Like I've always believed in it, and I've always felt that I don't need to go to school to learn something. You know, anything that I wanted to learn, I could. I could Google it. There's uh, online courses. There's like millions of books. So, so actually, if you Absolutely. look at my bookshelf behind me, I've got yes. like <laughs> I've got and mine like, too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I've I've got it's tons of books that. and yeah and and you know there was a period in my life uh, around the time when I was starting Nebbish, I was reading a lot of self help books because I felt like emotionally I wasn't in a very good stage. And uh, and I was reading a lot, and I think as a result, you know, you you have the power, as you said, to to change things and, and change your mindset, irrespective of how old you are. It's not you don't yes. have to be forty or fifty or whatever. No, to, no, to, not to, at to, all, not at all. To, yeah, to understand that. And 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 the other thing, actually, that I do usually when when I have anxiety about something, like you know, when something out of control happens, which is like similar to the situation you've described. Uh, which happens a lot, by the way, and, and you know, in entrepreneurship, there's always a, you know, for every high, there's a, there's a low. Uh, and, and this is not, not something I thought about, but actually someone gave me that uh, advice and he is also an entrepreneur. And he told me, you know, when you're feeling so anxious, give yourself a time limit. So say I'm anxious, like I'm very upset about X, Y, Z, and I'm going to allow myself, I don't know, one hour yeah of like me yeah. dwelling on it and and being pissed off about it and and exactly. blaming myself and hating myself exactly and, and that's that. really that's really important because we get stuck in these negative thought loops and so Absolutely. that's a great way uh, yeah. of handling something like this where you just you're you're gonna take this hour or two and you yeah. just put you know all your thoughts on paper of everything you know that's troubling yeah. you or yeah. you know all all this that you're going yeah. through and yeah. dedicate the time to think about that and then move on. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's a situation maybe you have no control over, but, uh, but, but still you can, you can acknowledge it, be upset about it. And then, and then you move on. And sometimes, on, like, yeah. sometimes like on that same night, you know, I'd be thinking, okay, let me, let me, let me take an extra half an hour of me being <laughs> upset about it. The, <laughs> upset. Thoughts, the thoughts just come back to my mind. Come right back in. Of course, of course. Exactly. Negative Sometimes thoughts, you just need yeah. To they just uh, they just come back right in. They consume you. They, they consume, consume your the space in your mind. Absolutely. And something that can help get you out of it is a mentor who can talk you through it. And when you discuss it with someone else that's more experienced like a mentor or, you know, uh, someone who's had previous experience, it really helps get you through this and gets yeah. you out of your head. So on that note, I always like to ask my guests if they have any recommendations in terms of books that, let's say, have made an impact on you or in terms of uh, tools that you use. So, uh, so I don't know, like, one of my guests told me that she uses uh, Inside Timer, for example, which is like a meditation app and it helps her. So I don't know. Do you have any uh, any recommendations yeah. for anyone? What, what's, helped me, what's helped me like uh, is, is when you find anything that will get you to unplug. My something that got me to unplug and de-stress is always sports. I love sports. I love to run and bike and do anything outdoors. And that really helps and un, you know you unwind you unplug you de-stress and you're in flow and you're in the zone where you're in that hobby or activity or sport that you enjoy so think of what sport or hobby you enjoy this really gets you to unplug that's number one that's really important and i think practicing mindfulness is also something very beneficial uh what that means is that you just take a few minutes out of your day to uh, to practice mindfulness practice meditation it's zero thought sort of thing and so 
Uh, there's lots of apps that can help you do that. Um, uh, and it's being in silence, really. Being in silence really helps clear your mind. Uh, being in nature helps clear your mind. Um, uh, and another thing I would say is like books, of course, like uh, I, I like Jim Quick's uh, beca uh, Limitless uh, book. It's really interesting. It's all about, you know, uh, uh, how, how to learn better, how to grow better, how to, you know, expand your mind. And uh, th that was a really great one. Code of an Extraordinary Mind by uh, Vishen Lakhiani. And uh, talking about you know our belief systems that hold us back, um, so there are many amazing tools out there. It's all about you know getting your mind, your body, and your soul really aligned. Honestly, I believe in that. And and when we are aligned, we become in a state of flow where everything flows to us easier, and we're more energized, and we can give a lot more and accomplish a lot more. Great. Dina, on, on, on that thought, I think uh, I'd like to thank you so much for uh, thank you <laughs> for uh, joining me today and for sharing the story of Injaz. And uh, I'm gonna be looking forward to see you know what uh, what's next for you and how you're gonna take all <laughs> that learning and how it's gonna come out <laughs> on the other end. Uh, Thanks, Lulu. I'm, Such I'm a sure, pleasure. Uh, I'm sure your I'm sure your you. kids uh, uh, see you as a as a big role model. Uh, ah. to, to <laughs> you them. should ask them. They're, two of them are going into their teens now. Wow! <laughs> You'll get a lot of eye rolling <laughs> with that. <statement>. Really? <laughs> oh, okay. Really? Why? Uh, now you know that age. Uh, the, all right. Okay. You know the preteen age when their kids like my son is still seven. Yeah. And, he sees me that way. <laughs> but when they're preteens, you know how preteens are with their moms. Well, I'm, I'm not yet. I, I'm, I'm still not You'll experience yet, so. that soon. I will experience it. I know how I was as a teen and I was unbearable. Yeah. So, yeah, I, can, I can imagine. I can yes. imagine. But but I'm sure I'm sure uh, I'm sure you've instilled a lot of uh, values and I'm sure yeah, you, I hope. you are a great <laughs> Thank you. For them. Yeah, and I and I look forward to hear uh, more of your news. Thanks, and Lulu. Thank you for likewise, the time. thank you, so, thank you. It was such a pleasure talking to you and catching up with you. It's been so long. Such an honor to be on the podcast with you, Lulu. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. So thank you, everybody that was watching. That was episode ten of Conversations with Lulu. A very special episode with a with a great friend, uh, Dina Al Mufti, is a great entrepreneur uh, from Egypt. Uh, as usual, if you like the show, please subscribe and uh, and please recommend us to your friends. Uh, um, the show is available on all podcast platforms, and also the video interview is available on YouTube under Conversations with Lulu. Thank you very much, everyone. Until next time, stay safe, everybody. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can support the show by subscribing for free and leaving us a review on any of the platforms. Until next time, stay safe, everyone.